Hello, I'm Dr. Tess Laurie, and welcome to Tess Talks. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Tina Pierce, who's worked as a consultant in sexual and reproductive health for many years with a menopause, uh, a special interest in menopause, and more recently uh, in MCAS and histamine intolerance. During COVID, Tina became an, a UK authority on treating long COVID, and she opened a long COVID clinic in November 2020. In September, she shared her expertise with colleagues at the UK Doctors' Conference in London. Tina, it's a pleasure to have you on Test Talks today. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak about one of my favourite subjects. <laughs> well, um, most people will never have heard about MCAS, yet it's increasingly common. What is MCAS? Well, it's, it's a very good question. Um, the, the problem with MCAS is that it's only recently been put together as a syndrome, uh, in fact, in the 1990s, and was given a name, uh, I think, in 1999, something like that. And it wasn't until 2007 when the first um, publications started to appear of case studies. So most doctors haven't heard of it either. <laughs> Although, as a result of long COVID, I must say the tide is turning and more and more doctors are becoming familiar with at least the name and some with the condition itself, which is great. We think it occurs in about 17% of the population. So it's a condition that is frequently seen and seldom recognized, actually. Um, so GPs are seeing it all the time. And we all know people who have got MCAS. Um, and it is a congenital sorry, it's a genetic rather than congenital, genetic condition uh, which affects the mast cells. And the mast cells um, are part of our immune system and they're the first bit of our immune system really that, the, that comes into contact with the environment. So the mast cells are interstitial, so they're generally not in the bloodstream but in the tissues. They're under the skin, they're lining the mucous membranes in the, in the mouth, in the throat, the nasal passages, they're in the lungs, they're lining our gut. So anywhere where there's an interface between the environment and the uh, and the person, the mast cells will be there. And I think of them like um, like um, the um, people standing at the what are, what are the people called who stand at the um, entrance of a club and they the bouncers. Yeah. They, yes, the bouncers in a club and they're they're stopping any foreign bodies and anything that shouldn't really be affecting the body coming in. Okay, so that's what their job is. And in about 17% of the population, um, they are slightly abnormal. They can be very severely abnormal or they could be very mildly abnormal. There are about 50 different um, mutations that have been identified in the kit genes. Uh, we, and unfortunately, that test isn't available commercially. So we can't test patients for it genetically at the moment. But um, let me just ask, sorry to interrupt, but I was yeah, just thinking, yeah. you know, if, the, if these are cells that are bounces to, you know, environmental um, uh, sort of sensitivities to, to environmental it's almost like what comes first? Is it the genetic thing that comes first or is it, uh, you know, the environmental uh, assault or uh, um, um, what do you call it, uh, antigen? Uh, yeah, it's a good it question. <laughs> yeah. So so they norm they are there to respond to chemical stimuli and, and foreign materials. And in some patients, um, they are just too sensitive. And when we talk about genetics, there are all sorts of environmental factors and epigenetic, they're called epigenetic factors that can affect the, the way that our, um, our cells respond and work. So they can be changed by chemicals, drugs, infections, um, et cetera, stress. Um, so things in the environment can make the response of those mast cells worse. Um, but in the, the way I think of it is the patients who have the mast cell activation, they've got their mast cells are more ready to be on red alert and to overreact and to be hyperstimulated than those who haven't got mast cell activation syndrome. So um, this um, overactivation causes them to release over a thousand different um, uh, cytokines into the, into the system. And we know that some of those those even chemicals, even in the tiniest doses, are very, very potent. And um, one of them that we know the most about is histamine. And if the mast cells release histamine, they contain it in little granules inside them, and they just release them into the system, and they cause hyper inflammation. So 
um, vasodilatation, redness, itchiness, all of the symptoms that we associate with histamine. So um, would histamine but, usually be a useful chemical that the, the body needs? Yes. But if you have too much of it, then it becomes rather a burden <laughs> and, uh, and a nuisance. So um, so if it's released in the gut, it causes IBS and people have bloating, constipation, diarrhea, perhaps gastroparesis where their gut doesn't, is very lazy and it doesn't work very well. They can get acid reflux. Um, so it becomes too, you know, histamine is very useful. Histamine is you're absolutely right. It's it's part of our circadian rhythm. So it helps us sleep. So often when people have very high histamine, they get insomnia. Um, it is very important for releasing acid in our stomachs, uh, which helps with protein digestion. But if you have too much of it, then you're going to have acid reflux. You're going to have inf inflammation and discomfort in the gut. Um, it, so it has some very important uh jobs to do. But if there's too much of it, then you get too much inflammation, too much reactivity, and then it becomes um, uh, problematic. And um, so, yes, yeah, so there are other um, uh, cytokines that are also released. And we were all used to hearing about the cytokine storm now because of COVID. Um, and, um, and some of them are things like heparin. So people often have very easy bruising. Uh, and they, if you ask them, you know, do you bruise easily? They're like, yes, my legs are always covered in bruises. And I never knew why. And it's because their mast cells are constantly releasing heparin into their system. So it, it can be a, a real trial for these poor patients. And um, in my experience, people who have fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, um, who have uh, chronic headaches, uh, tachycardia, rosacea, eczema, um, psoriasis, um, IBS, um, all of those kind of conditions, oh, POTS as well is, is related to it. Um, hypermobility is related to it. Um, there, it. So it's quite, I think it's quite a complex picture with genetically, but these are all the syndromes that seem to be affected and present in mast cell activation. You don't have to have all of them, but certainly some people will have fibromyalgia, others will say they have ME, others will have IBS and so on. And food intolerances is a big one. So yeah, it's it's a very interesting condition. Most doctors have don't know very much about it, unfortunately. Um, but most patients who have it know an awful lot about it now <laughs> because we we've managed to get the word out there about the condition, and there are various face group, you know, book um, Facebook groups and um, and websites which can people can find uh, various resources and are very helpful. And um, um, there's a lot of um, attention now, especially with integrative medicine to to look at the root causes of mm. of conditions so do you have uh, insight into what could be the root cause uh of mcas i'm, I'm thinking in the context of you know fibromyalgia for example you know yeah. is is mcas causing fibromyalgia or you know how, what is the relationship and then what is causing the mcas or you know how do all these these so, different so what, conditions interact Yes, we, we need to do more research into it. It's a very new science and um, and there is a, we don't know half of what we need to know. But my understanding is that the uh, genetic um, the genetic abnormalities or SNPs that these people have um, cause the mast cells to be overreactive. And then that will cause fibromyalgia or IBS or um, you know, it different, slightly differently in different people. But generally, all the patients I see who have fibromyalgia, when I ask them to, to take a history from them, I can identify that they have fairly typical MCAS histories. Um, and um, and when you know, if you have somebody who has uh, chronic chronic fatigue as well. You go into the history and you can work out that actually, you know, maybe as a baby, they had eczema. They've always reacted badly to insect bites. Um, maybe they cut labels out of their clothes. They can have sensitivity. Uh, all their nerves seem to be on end often, you know, so their skin is very sensitive to things like labels. Um, they often have a very, very strong sense of smell. Um, and um, we always have a laugh about that when I ask them about their sense of smell. And then they, you know, they say, how did you know my sense of smell is as the joke of the family because I can always smell you know something 50 yards away and nobody else can smell it um and uh, so they they seem to be sort of um more more sensitive to various things uh and of course food has a part to play in all of this because when some foods have got a lot of histamine in them 
And when we eat those foods, we push the histamine levels up in our body. And normally, normally we have diamine oxidase, an enzyme that reduces that histamine intake so that we're not overwhelmed with histamine. The body is constantly trying to keep histamine in balance. But quite a high percentage of people who have mast cell activation, first of all, they're going to be making too much histamine already. So they're already on you know, quite a high level of histamine. But also many of them have some genetic predispositions to not making enough diamine oxidase. So they're deficient in the enzyme they need to keep their histamine down. And they also have a bit too much histamine around anyway. So food then can really upset them. And a lot of people will say, I'm intolerant to gluten or, you know, um, uh, eggs upset me or uh, I can't have tomatoes or whatever it might be. And that's because of the histamine in those foods. So it's quite it's quite it's quite difficult when you have mast cell activation syndrome and you, if you need to bring down the histamine um, and avoid certain foods and some of them will be your favorite foods, you know. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing so much of it now, because our modern diets are so histaminic. They really are. I mean, when I was a little girl, people had, you know, instant coffee. And now everybody has fresh coffee makers at home and they sit, they stand on the station with a, you know, a cup of a cup of uh, Costa, whatever. And it's it's very strong coffee. So if you have um, a problem with histamine, then you're going to be topping up your histamine with your coffee, your tea, your tomatoes, your spinach, your avocados, all the things that you could perhaps before only eat in season. And now people can have them all year round. Um, and of course, a lot of these things are healthy. Um, so they think they're doing themselves good by eating lots of avocados uh, during the week, but actually it, it could be making them quite ill if they have histamine problems. Hmm. So, so Tina, what's the connection between long COVID and MCAS then? Well, um, when I, I, I first learned about AIMCAS in 2016, when my youngest daughter became very ill, she'd been grumblingly sort of ill all her life. She's not, not grumbling. She's not a grumbly person, but she was, she was unwell all her life. And we could never quite work out what was going on with her. And then in 2016, she became super ill. Um, and she had about 30 symptoms and couldn't function. And that's when it forced me to really, really examine what was going on. And that's when I came up with the diagnosis of histamine intolerance and mast cell activation syndrome. And um, and then um, so that's when I developed this big interest in the condition. And once you know something, you can't unknow it. Um, so I started to accidentally make the diagnosis in about six or seven people a week who I was seeing for contraception. And when I was taking a full history from them to work out which contraception was the best, I was hearing about IBS and chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and chronic headaches and all of these sort of thing, you know, funny rashes, dermatographism and so on. And I would say to them, oh, I think I might know what you've got. And they would burst into tears because they'd literally had these conditions for decades and nobody had been able to sort of put them together and work out what was going on. And then I would help them with a low histamine diet, some antihistamines, some vitamins and minerals to support their system. And, um, and they would get better. You know, they would feel so much better. And they'd come back and say, it's transformational. You've changed my life. This is amazing. Um, I feel so much better. So I'd had since 2016 doing this. And then um, in it started in the spring of 2020, actually, when I started hearing about some of the post-mortems in Italy with the people with acute COVID, do you remember there was a lot in the press about hyperinflammation and they were finding hyperinflammation in the patients who were dying from acute COVID? And that captured my, you know, caught, I, that caught my sort of imagination, if you like, that it was, well, that sounds like what we get in mast cell activation, we get hyperinflammation. Mm. And then there was this report which talked about elastase 2. It talked about membranes breaking down. It talked about some bleeding um, and it talked about some blood clots all in this lung biopsy, you know, lung sample at postmortem. And I started thinking, well, that's mast cell activation. That's what a release of all of these cytokines from the, um, from the mast cells could do in somebody if it really got carried away because it releases elastase too, it releases uh, some, uh, some of the uh, clotting factors and it also releases heparin. So then I thought, well, if that's the case, then we can treat acute COVID with simple things, simple measures like vitamins and minerals. So vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, 
um, selenium and magnesium, um, quercetin, which is a mast cell stabilizer that you can buy over the counter, and some antihistamines that you can buy over the counter. So loratadine, 10 milligrams, but not once a day, maybe three or four times a day, or cetirizine, um, fexofenadine, et cetera. So when... Um, I didn't open an acute COVID clinic because I thought I would never be able to go to bed and sleep. But I did come across people who had acute COVID. And that was when it was the Wuhan variant, which was quite severe in, in many people. And um, and so I started recommending this these treatments for them. And they got better within 24 to 48 hours. So it it sort of made me feel, well, yes, there's a lot of, you know, maybe the people who are getting really into difficulty with acute COVID are the ones who have mast cell activation, and it is 17% of the population. And figures were coming out saying about 17 to 20% of the population were having difficulty with COVID. So it seemed to sort of, you know, fit. It looked a little bit like, you know, if you applied Bradford Hill criteria to it, maybe you would come up with, yes, it is related. Um, and then in the August of that year, in 2020, I started hearing about long COVID and um, and it, how it sounded like ME um, and it sounded like my patients with muscle activation. Um, so I decided to go on uh, television and I went on to um, BBC Look East and I asked patients with long COVID to download a free app called the People With app and uh, put in all of their symptoms so I could look and see if it looked very similar. And over 2000 people did download the app and put in all their data, which was fantastic. And they all looked exactly like the mast cell activation symptoms. So then I felt I really ought to open a clinic. Um, so I opened that on the 1st of November um, in 2020, because I thought I can help these people and no one seemed to be able to help them. Um, so I thought, well, at least I have to have a try and do what I can and use my clinical experience and knowledge and expertise and and, and, you know, we're always taught as doctors to look for patterns and recognize patterns. And that's what I was doing, really. Um, so I did open the clinic and I was curious to see, I wanted to know, were all the patients with long COVID undiagnosed, previously undiagnosed um, and untreated mast cell activation patients in whom the um, the uh, virus had really, really aggravated their mast cells and caused hyperinflammation, or or had the virus caused MCAS in them and they were previously absolutely fit and healthy with normal mast cells. And actually, I found that 99, 98, 99% of my patients had previous undiagnosed, untreated mast cell activation in their history. Um, and um, even though they were healthy people, of course, but they had a bit of IBS, food intolerances or, you know, whatever. And so I started using the same treatment in these patients and lo and behold, they started getting better. Um, and it's a long it's a long haul, <laughs> um, but we know that the spike protein can persist in the monocytes for at least 15 months. So it's not a surprise that it's a long, you know, that in some patients it takes longer than others for them to get better, but they all have got better or are getting better, uh, which has been very gratifying. Um, when I was treating um, MCAS in my patients pre-COVID and everything, I started to realize that we needed to drill down more and more um, into how to help and support their systems. So I started looking at their genetics of uh, their methylation cycles in their liver, um, their, um, their histamine metabolism, uh, et cetera, and looking to see how their body copes with um, detoxifying, you know, the met their met metabolic processes and making their ATP and their SAMe and all the things that you need to be healthy. And I found that knowing the genetics was incredibly valuable because we could see which genes were a bit lazy and needed support. And you can support them with vitamins and minerals and which specific vitamins and minerals, therefore, that patient needed to be on. And that was actually a bit of a game changer and helped us to um, really help support um, them to, towards wellness. Um, and the other thing was analyzing their gut and the microbiome. And we know more and more now about the microbiome being really important in a person's health. And if we can support that to support their immune systems and uh, support good good health, then we can also, uh, you know, really um, advance and reduce some of their symptoms. So, yeah, it's been a very interesting journey, really. And now, of course, um, I'm seeing not just long COVID patients. Um, 
but I'm seeing a few people who are vaccine injured. And many of the vaccine injured patients I'm seeing have also got a previous history of untreated and undiagnosed MCAS. So there's, I'm not quite sure what's going on there, but it seems that it's, it's you know, I suppose it's all about the spike protein, isn't it? And the spike protein does go through the ACE2 receptor into the mast cells and, and aggravate them. And if you've got slightly abnormal ones in the beginning, then that's With not or, good. Or a sensitivity to foreign yeah. stuff generally. Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. You know, and some of the patients can become so sensitive. They are sensitive to, you know, their mobile phone. Um, the radiation to electromagnetic frequencies, they're sensitive to that and, or chemicals. Somebody, you know, walking from a, a cold room into a warm room can set them off. Um, somebody walking past with perfume can set them off. So they can become very chemically sensitive. Um, and yes, and I think, you know, when you think about it, the 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 if somebody has a cold, uh, sorry, if somebody catches COVID, um, which is a you know it was a respiratory disease. Uh, they would maybe have someone cough on them, and they would get a hundred, a thousand, maybe ten thousand spike protein for their body to deal with. But when they're injected with the Pfizer, for example, vaccine, it actually has thirteen billion messenger RNA in it, which will then enter previously healthy cells and will set up factories to make the spike protein, which is the pathogen. And so you actually may end up making trillions of spike protein. And those spike protein, we now know the pathophysiology of what the spike protein does in the body. Um, And over a thousand papers have been written peer reviewed papers and printed in various journals about what the spike protein is doing in the body. So we know that. Um, and um, and so it, it's no surprise that it's going to affect your mast cells. Um, and those who have a propensity to hypersensitivity, it's going to be even worse. So one or two of my patients um, have I've had particular rheumatoid problems, you know, really, really painful joints. Um, and uh, but again, treating them so it has really been helpful, really helpful. Yeah. Um, there's yeah. a very good, sorry. May I just ask, are, are the people you're seeing now, because um, um, you're only one person and the need is so great. I'm just wondering, are the people you're seeing now, majority of people you were seeing before with your menopause clinic, or are there a lot of new uh, people? Uh, people? Yeah, a lot of new people. Mm-hmm. So one or two of my patients, um, I was looking after them before with um, with. Uh, menopause in my menopause work so hrt and i've had one or two patients who actually were slightly in denial when i diagnosed mast cell activation in them um and they came for hrt and i you know again you take a full history and listen to the patient and they tell you about various symptoms and sometimes patients um think well actually i'm quite fit and healthy i don't need to worry about what i'm eating and so on and so forth and um and one or two of those patients have have come really unstuck when they've had the vaccine because it's really aggravated their um, their mast cells, and and so one one patient I can think of, she she had been so fit and healthy, she'd be doing sixteen thousand steps a day. She loved walking, and she was really great exerciser, very fit woman. Um, and uh, but she did have some mast cell issues, you know, which which I tried to encourage her to to address, but she wasn't sort of ready to do that, so that's fine. Um, and she was on HRT, and um, and then she rang me up. And said, Tina, I really, really need your need your help because I'm I can hardly walk. I'm so crippled from joint pain. And the story was that the joint pain came on immediately after the set the first dose, um, and then it sort of settled over a sort of six eight week period. It wasn't quite so bad, um, although um, she wasn't able to walk upstairs, for example, or turn over in bed very easily. So it was really very debilitating, um, and she was persuaded to have the second dose which she had and of course her her joints flared even more and became even more painful um and then she felt quite coerced and bullied into having the third because she really didn't want to have it because she felt so unwell and she also felt systemically unwell it wasn't just her joints that hurt but she really didn't feel well at all she wasn't able to exercise to walk even walking across the room was painful um and she had the third dose. And then she contacted me. um, And she had seen various consultants, one of whom was a rheumatologist who said to her, you're going to need to have all your joints replaced. 
And she texted me and said, do you think I should have my joints replaced? And I said, no, 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 please don't have your joints replaced. You do not need your joints replaced. You, you've got inflammation. We can sort this out. Um, so we gave her, um, We I worked, start working through the protocol, the FLCCC protocol that I've worked. Yeah, that's the protocol of. you helped. To yes, yes, I was being involved. I mean, some fantastic doctors in the States have put together this protocol and I've put in my little halfpenny worth. And, um, and we... Um, so I've been, I was working through that and I told, you know, intermittent fasting, cold showers, ivermectin um, and uh, antihistamines and various vitamins and minerals, a lot of natural stuff, you know, nutraceuticals, vitamins and minerals to support the body. Anyway, she six days after starting the ivermectin, she texted me and said, I'm a completely changed woman. I can, my pain has gone. I do not need to have any painkillers now for the first time in over 15 months. Um, and she just couldn't believe it. She couldn't believe it. Um, and now she's she's exercising again. She's got a personal trainer. She's going to the gym. She's walking again. She's so much better. And all because we worked with her body and supported what was happening in her body. And she, we're helping her clear out the, the spike protein. There's a protocol that we've put together to help the body clear out the spike protein, whether you've had COVID or the vaccine, which I really believe is terribly, terribly important for everybody to do. So we, we all need to do that. Um, and I can run through that if you like very quickly. Yeah, That's just do. Yeah. Please do. Yeah. So, the protocol that I give out to everyone, and there are several different ones available, um, but I ask them to do intermittent fasting. So eat in a six hour or to eight hour window and maybe once a week only have one meal uh, a day. Um, and then the second thing is to try and have a cold shower. Two minutes is the best. If you can do anything up to two minutes, that's great. Um, a lot of people do cold water swimming now, which is fantastic. So that's become very popular. Resveratrol, which boosts your mitochondria and supports the mitochondria, and 500 milligrams twice a day. The resveratrol is very important because the spike protein destroys the mitochondria. So we need to restore the health of the mitochondria. Um, and then um, sodium butyrate, 300 milligrams daily, and melatonin, slow release, two milligrams to 10 milligrams at night, three or four times a week. Um, now, the the intermittent fasting, the cold showers and the resveratrol, they really increase autophagy in the body, which is how your body gets rid of damaged or diseased cells. So this process of autophagy is the body clearing out any cells that have got the messenger RNA in them or spike protein in them or an infection or, um, or actually um, uh, any cancerous cells as well, any precancerous cells or cells that are not right, the body gets rid of them with autophagy. Now we know that the spike protein prevents autophagy. It reduces autophagy and it also stimulates autophagy inhibitors in the body. So we need to do those three things to counteract that because we need to clear this, the, you know, the, the, the disease cells out. The resveratrol also, together with the sodium butyrate and the melatonin, are very anti-cancer. Uh, melatonin has many, many anti-cancer properties, so it's really useful. Um, and the sodium butyrate is important because butyrate is in our gut and it helps to prevent leaky gut. It is anti-inflammatory, it's highly antioxidant, and it also is anti-cancer in the gut. It protects the, the gut against cancer. And the spike protein destroys the butyrate, it steals it. So very important to restore it. And we certainly have seen an increase in a lot of cancers um, since the vaccine program, unfortunately. So, um, you know, we have to bear in mind, everyone needs to bear in mind that th these were rushed to market. There were only studies for two and two and a half months, very, very short length of time, no medium and long term safety data. Um, and now we're getting that medium term data. <laughs> it's starting to come through and it's an increase in cancers, increase in heart attack, strokes, sudden death, um, neurological diseases and so on and so forth. So yeah, we need to clear it out of our bodies with that protocol. So did I get uh, get what you said right, Tina, that you think people who haven't been vaccinated should do the detox as well? Or yes, I, if they've had COVID, I think so. Because anyone who's been exposed to this spike protein, whether you catch uh, your exposure is by COVID or by the injections, 
it's I think it's a good thing to cleanse the body and detoxify. Yes, definitely. Um, but obviously, you've got fewer to deal with if you caught COVID than if you have been vaccinated. Yeah. Mm. I have to say, I'm a bit of a ninny when it comes to cold showers. But I did have a swim in a river the other day, which was beautiful and cold and refreshing. So, yeah. Oh, well done. <laughs> Very good. Yes, I know the cold showers. You can build up to them slowly. I encourage patients to, you know, start slowly. You can just do ten seconds, and then you know, start with a warm shower, and then just make it a bit colder, 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 and see how long you can do it for. Yeah, it's one of those things that I uh, that sort of evokes this, you know, involuntary shriek. No matter, yeah. no matter who you are, I'm sure no matter how many times you've done it. Yes. Um, <laughs> but I think that's the good bit. That sort of that sharp intake of breath. Is is good for your immune system, and of course, then you can't help but laugh at how silly you yeah. are in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> well, the sounds when... but it's good. It make, yeah. If it makes us laugh as well, that's good. We need it to is laugh. Good. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. laughter yeah. therapy. So, I just was wondering, um, in terms of your uh, menopause clinic, are yeah. you seeing anything different um, apart from the MCAS, as we've as you've discussed, mm-hmm. but among the symptomatology of women who've um, who've been vaccinated with the COVID vaccine? Yes, I am. I am. I've got a lo- loads more women ringing me up and or emailing me uh, to tell me that they're having bleeding irregularities. So women who have been stable on their HRT for 10 years and have had no bleeding, suddenly very big, heavy bleeds. Um, and of course, we have to take that seriously. We have to investigate it. They have to have scans, maybe biopsies and so on to see what's causing it. Um, and it's just happening so frequently frequently now uh, that so many women, I think it's about 30% of women who are vaccinated will have some kind of bleeding irregularity or um, postmenopausal women will start bleeding. So it's a pretty high percentage. Um, And the other thing that I'm seeing, I'm afraid, is lots of cancer, which is heartbreaking. So in my practice before, I would see one patient every two to three years Um, in my clinics who would be some of my menopause patients who would ring me up or email me and tell me that actually they've just been diagnosed with breast cancer. And it would be one every two to three years. And I've had about 11 in the last, since April, I've had 11 women tell me that they've had breast cancer. And some of them who've been in remission for many years, it's it's come back. Um, And I do know that there are, um, I know of an oncologist who has been telling his patients um, who are in remission not to have the vaccine because he's seeing it too. He's seeing a lot of people who are in remission um, now with cancer. And it's not a surprise, you know, if you've got a spike protein that's switching off autophagy, Um, that actually also uh, uh, down regulates three cancer regulating genes that protect us against cancer. So the P53, the BRCA1 and the PRB gene uh, are down regulated by the spike protein, which means they don't work so efficiently. And they're constantly checking us for cancer and getting rid of cancers in our body. And it also upregulates 17 um, genes that can cause cancer. So you've got this down regulation of the protective ones, upregulation of the, of the not so good dodgy ones. Um, And then you've got uh, the T lymphocytes also um, destroyed by the spike protein. And they they have an important role to play um, in in reducing our cancer risk. Um, So the whole thing is um, very alarming. And I think we need to take stock um, and we need to get some proper discussion and data looked at, look at the data. (laughs) Well, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, I certainly know that, um, you know, the MHRA, our UK authorities, and in fact, none of the authorities, the World Health Organization and uh, the, the US authorities uh, have been doing the um, their required um, safety audits of uh, of their mm-hmm. uh, accumulating COVID vaccine data. So um, it, it, the, your um, opinion and your experience and doctors like you sharing your experiences of what you're seeing are incredibly valuable to the public mm-hmm. to help everybody, you know, make up their own minds about whether to um, take further injections or not. Uh, and, and it seems like there isn't really even, uh, I know you mentioned that there's a, a thousand papers out there, but those are not really uh, making it to the public awareness or the corporate media. No, uh, no, I, I do hope that, mm, that many people will uh, will take your advice and um, 
Mm, they have to think very carefully, do lots of homework, because we know, I mean, we know from some of the documents that have been released that Pfizer knew um, that over that were over 1,200 deaths directly attributed to the vi- vaccine within the first two months of its release globally. They knew of over 1,200 deaths and over 40,000 ad- serious adverse drug reactions. So they knew, they knew about it. And the MHRA and the FDA must also know about it. Mm. Uh, and certainly the figures have gone way up since then uh, on the uh, yellow card system and the VAERS system and the um, Euro, you know, the Euro, Euro, um, European one as well. So uh, we know this and uh, we need to take stock. Uh, you know, I, we, we were taught as doctors to be very cautious <laughs> And to um, to think critically, to assess things constantly, because it's constantly that things are changing all the time, the data is changing and so on, to make sure that we stayed up to date, up to speed with it all. And to, to err on the side of caution. And, you know, if you have somebody who has an adverse reaction to a, a medication, you don't give it to them again. Mm. Um you just it's just don't don't give it to them again and uh, especially when we know that omicron has a survival rate of 99.98% now so and even in the worst time wuhan was 99% for most of the population survival you know and it is bizarre that that you know the, what doctors are saying and you know and according to the package and said well you've got a one in 10 chance of having a side effect it's perfectly normal to have a side effect and it might be fever and you might be you know uh, very unwell for 3 days but that's all normal well it's not normal and certainly when you are a healthy person you shouldn't be made sick by a medicine no, no. you know you absolutely should. absolutely and it's you know we know now in america the figures have gone from um for Four in a million myocarditis to twenty-five thousand in a million myocarditis incidents, you know, and that that is astronomical. Um, and we know myocarditis isn't mild or um, or rare, therefore, um, and it's certainly not mild. We expect twenty percent of the people to die within within five years. Mm. You know, and I heard yesterday, I heard yesterday of one of one of my patients. This is the other thing that's happening in my practice is my patients are now telling me constantly about family and friends and people they know who are dropping down dead or having cancer or being very, very unwell, whereas previously they were very fit and healthy. And you can't help but know, you can't help but see it. You know, <laughs> you'd, you'd have to be deaf and blind not to, to hear about this. And one of my patients yesterday, she told me about a, a friend who, um, he was um, 42 and he was diagnosed with myocarditis um, and in, um, when was it? In November last year he was diagnosed with myocarditis and then um recently he's just dropped down dead with a heart attack no 42 he was fit and healthy mm-hmm. he was absolutely fine and another patient yesterday told me about a friend of hers who the um the the father uh, of the, in the family he had a massive heart attack and he was like 45 and then his son's girlfriend who was 18 years old had um had a heart attack well i have never never yeah. heard of young young women having heart attacks ever in my whole career I'm, i've been qualified 40 40 years next year and th- th- i've never heard of, mm. of young people suddenly dropping down dead and and having heart attacks and things so something needs to be investigated it's strange it seems strange to me that the government was all over the figures when they thought that they were covid deaths and they were, you know, constantly talking about them and reporting them, and this many people have died from COVID, and so on and so forth. And um, and now people are dying. We've got twenty two and a half thousand extra deaths since April in this country, unexplained, and nobody's saying anything about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, Jordan, just, and yeah. I was just want I keep getting messages from my GP surgery uh, saying, "Come for your flu jab." Now I've never taken a flu or flu vaccine. I've never taken a flu vaccine in my life. What on earth is going on? And what is, it's almost a harassment, you know, sort of every every couple of weeks, come book your book your flu vaccine now. Yeah. What on earth is going on? And and why is there this pressure now to take flu vaccines as well? Do you I've know? I've no idea. I've no idea. And and I just think people need to get back to to our grassroots. We are fit and healthy. Rely on nature. Look after yourselves. Have a healthy diet. Exercise. Get some fresh air. Go for walks in the woods. That's supposed to be fantastic for your mental and physical health. You know, have make sure that you do have your vitamins and minerals because even if you have an organic diet and you eat really well, there, it's going to be deficient, I'm afraid. So everyone should have a good multivitamin and mineral tablet every day, no matter how, you know, well you eat 
eat, you need to have uh, good doses of vitamin D, you know, five to 10,000 units a day of vitamin D all year round in this country. Um, you need to take good doses of vitamin C and let's be fit, go into the winter, fit and healthy, uh, lose weight, you know, intermittent fasting. The paleo ketogenic diet is brilliant for losing weight and for curing diabetes, type two diabetes. Um, so many patients have been cured of type two diabetes by doing the uh, intermittent fasting and the paleo ketogenic diet um, and getting very, very good results pretty quickly. So I would encourage everyone to look after themselves, take responsibility for your own health. You don't need to go and have vaccines all the time to be healthy. You're much better off relying on, on nature and, you know, looking after yourselves better, really. I think that's you know, you know, I've actually been uh, of the opinion that we should have, we should just be saying no more injections until we have transparency uh, from the pharmaceutical industry and we can trust them, which I think is going to be. I don't, not sure if that's actually possible. And I agree, the route is actually to just uh, really go back to nature and take responsibility for your health. But, but mm -hmm. you know, I'm in favour of of a campaign that says no more injections for you know for healthy people. Certainly, you know, talking about vaccines and even contraceptive injections, because again, it's sort of a route in to the body. Uh, mm -hmm. And we have no control uh, over no dis full disclosure mm -hmm. from these farm companies about what they put in. But I, has this changed? I know you've got a beautiful granddaughter. Uh, has this changed your um, attitude towards childhood vaccination? And what are you advising your daughter, for example, uh, with regard to childhood vaccination? Well, I've, I've got three grandchildren. And um and it's a very difficult conversation to have. I, I actually think that we, like you, I agree with you. Now, I'm, I'm not an anti-vaxxer by any stretch of the imagination. And I had two AstraZeneca myself, you know, um, before any of the data came out. And um, I was very nervous about it. I didn't, I wasn't frightened of COVID and I didn't think I needed it, but I was persuaded that I needed to do it in order to see my patients and uh, et cetera. So I had them and um and I now I'm looking into uh, things like the trustworthiness of pharmaceutical companies uh, and the data that we have about all vaccines. And I'm not sure at all. And I would if I if yeah, I would advise my children not to have their children vaccinated now because I'm seeing data now which suggests that prior to the vaccine programs, you didn't see ADHD um, so much, you didn't see allergies so much, you didn't see asthma so much, you didn't have so many childhood uh, cancers and so on. And that really worries me. And I think until we know the answer, we shouldn't be doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, why do something you're not sure about unless you've got absolute proof that it's it's not connected to any of those things or caused any of those things? Then there is the let's let's just take it back. Children who are not vaccinated are often the healthiest children and don't keep coming down with colds and they have the best immune systems and so on. So and then, and I I have many friends who did not vaccinate their children and their children are now grown up and are absolutely fit and healthy and fine, you know. So I think I think we need to take stock of everything. We need to step back and say, let's stop for the moment until we can prove that something is totally safe. And we need, as you say, transparency uh, and clear, open debate, um, not just from experts who are sort of behind some door we know we, know, we never hear who they are or what qualifications they have or you know they never seem to take responsibility for their expert opinion which is often wrong um yeah mm. well said <laughs> thank you so much it's been such a pleasure speaking with you and i look forward to meeting up in person sometime and having a coffee <laughs> <laughs> lovely <laughs> thanks so much Gina. bye bye bye, bye.